There is nothing more magical than a sunrise at Bryce Canyon as the morning rays creep over the canyon's famous hoodoos. These layers that make these colorful hoodoos at Bryce Canyon were deposited in a freshwater lake only about 40 million years ago. And much of the modern landscape was coming into existence when the rocks at Bryce Canyon were laid down. A lot of people really like these colorful hoodoos at Bryce because you're very intimate with them when you go there. The park is not large. It's easy to get close to all of the features at Bryce. And sometimes you get this reflected light back onto the hoodoos and it makes them almost come alive for people when they visit there. So how did these hoodoos come to be? At the time these ancient lakes existed, this area of the Colorado Plateau was a giant basin, and although water could flow in, there were no rivers to carry the water out. Instead, sediment forming at the bottom of the lakes just kept building up. Yeah, well, actually we get the request to Kevin Poe, affectionately called the singing geologist, gives talks at Bryce. He compares the sediment to the residue in a bottle containing an instant orange drink, Tang. Um, sediment, yes, of course, okay. So whew, here we are on the top of Dutton's Grand Staircase, which he called the Pink Cliffs, which is, I mean, you know, was the guy colorblind? I mean, come on, this is orange, right? Uh, well, it wasn't that he was colorblind, it's just that Dutton never really got very close, as it turns out. When you look at this same layer of rock, clear out on the horizon there, there's the Powell Point, named for Dutton's boss, John Wesley Powell, uh, and you'll see when you have to look through all that atmosphere disturbance, the rock does kind of turn pink. But when you're sitting right on top of it, it's orange, because of course, that was the ingredient, iron, in this lake system, right? And you know, and it wasn't tang, it was limestone, but limestone, like sugar, does completely dissolve in water up until the saturation point. And so with this lake, more and more limestone being added, kind of like the tang addict, eventually you start to get the sediment forming at the bottom. And instead of orange 47 or whatever the heck this artificial color is, it was the iron that mixed in there to give it that beautiful color. Now the rest of the story is that the Colorado Plateau finally begins to rise. When it rises, it rises so that what was a lake basin before gets turned wrong side out. You know, it gets lifted up high, so now the lake drains, and all that ooze left behind could lithify to become the rock and the limestone that is Bryce Canyon. And as I kind of look through your faces here in the audience today, I can see that pretty much none of you really care about that. And uh, that's okay, because they make me say all that stuff at the beginning about how the rock forms. But come on, I know what's really going on. The reason why you pay $25 to get in here is not to know about how the rock formed, but to celebrate how the rock is being destroyed, right? That's what makes us special. Because first of all, we're not even a real canyon. What do you, what do you got to have to be a real canyon? Yeah, you got to have a river running through it. And even in a torrential downpour, you know, just water falling from the sky, buckets and buckets, um, we get a little tiny creek at the bottom. But as soon as the rain stops, well, the creek soaks into the ground, and that's it, okay? What you see out there is carved by water, but it's not flowing water. It's the freezing and thawing of water, frost wedging. So imagine that rock out there with all the different cracks in it. You could take my hand here and pretend it's one of these fins, one of these walls that sticks out. And, of course, it has cracks like the gaps between my fingers. And now you put some snow on top of it. And so let's say that it's like January, okay? Um, and because even though it's really cold at night, for several hours during the afternoon, it's above freezing. So that snow melts and has water, it trickles down inside the cracks, and then later at night when it freezes, what happens? It expands, good, as water turns to ice, it expands. But it, it also does something else. It does, because think about it this way, when water boils, it also expands. But when water freezes, it expands and gets hard. Who said that? I heard it somewhere. Hard. Yeah, exactly right. My old mean geology professor used to give us a zero on the entire exam. If you didn't remember, get hard. And then, and then what he would say is, um, decrease your density and get harder. Think about that for a minute, right? There's only one substance in the universe that can do that, and that's water. And that was the point he was trying to make, a spectacular process to, you know, expand and yet get harder. And so as water does this, it starts forcing apart holes in the rock. Eventually that hole becomes so large it can no longer support its weight, and the roof caves in, and the delicate sticky up things on either side, that's a hoodoo. 
That's, that's how they form. And those hundreds upon thousands of them you see out there were different parts of cracks and holes and rocks and now stand by themselves. So one last song about the ultimate fate of my beloved Bryce Canyon in the loose tradition of Peter, Paul, and Mary. <clears throat> Where will all the hoodoos go? Long time weathering. Where will all the hoodoos go? Three million years from now. Where will all the hoodoos go? East Severe River will tear them down. Now you have learned. Now you have learned about the Bryce Rocks. My name is Ranger Poe, and thanks for coming out and rocking today. <laughs> The middle step in the Grand Staircase is Zion National Park, a park that encompasses some of the most scenic canyon country in the United States. It is characterized by high plateaus, a maze of narrow, deep sandstone canyons, and striking rock towers and mesas. A lot of people who visit the Colorado Plateau think of Zion as being their favorite national park. And probably one of the reasons for that is because of all the great canyons that we have as national parks here on the Colorado Plateau. Zion is the only one where you stand next to the road at the bottom of the canyon and you look up to the rims on either side. Most of our national parks is where you look from the top and you look down at a very tiny river. But in Zion National Park, you can actually be in the heart of the canyon and you can see these fantastic walls of Navajo sandstone rising up both sides of your, your vehicle. You know, when you're down there at Zion, you see the beautiful towering white cliffs. One of the things you'll notice right away is the rocks don't have, their, well, they're weird. Instead of having nice flat lines in all that sedimentary rock the way sedimentary rock is supposed to be, what they have are these bizarre angles, right? You'll see a bunch of 15 degree angles stacked on top of each other for a while, and then maybe above those, some 30 degree angles for a while, and then some 15s and then some 30s going all the way up the top of these huge towering cliffs. If you can find the right place, the intersection, where you see those 15s meeting a 30 like this, this should remind you of something. Because Mother Nature only ever makes one thing with this shape in cross-section, and, and your big hint is it's made of sand. So, so what are we talking about here? What is this? Sand dune, exactly right, yeah. And be, because the physics of a sand dune is pretty simple. Basically, it's all about how hard it is to blow sand uphill, okay? You know, if you don't believe me, try it. Right? That's what science is all about. Just, <laughs> the best you'll ever do is maybe about 15 degrees blowing those little grains uphill. And if we were to, there's not a lot of wind, but let's say the wind's coming this way towards us, okay? So then the shape of the sand dune would be something like this, because the little grains, they'd go uphill, but once they get over the top of the slip face, once they're protected from the wind, then they can stick to each other up to about 30 degrees. And that's how you get that shape of a sand dune. Whether it's a sand dune in the Sahara Desert today, or a sand dune in a gigantic desert that was centered on this region about 200 million years ago. So here we've got the land now as a desert. Great big ocean of sand centered on the Utah region here. And uh, what you can see is that, you know, the whole Utah's covered, it's spreading out in different areas. And um, it's not that the wind blew continually the same direction over and over again. So they're not individual dunes that are gigantic tall, but they're dunes stacked on top of dunes. So, you know, if you were to imagine maybe for a few million years, the prevailing wind comes from the south. So you'd have a bunch of dunes that have this orientation. But then if the winds then come from the north, well, they'd flatten those off underneath and build new sand dunes that go this way. And then maybe, you know, over here from the east and then over here from the west, all the way up stacking sand dunes on top of sand dunes until eventually it all lithifies. You know, it turns to rock. And that's how you get the sandstone, the white cliffs. <laughs>